Hello again, and welcome back to Mapping Hour. This is episode 12. Great to have you back. And just a reminder that we've got a login waiting for you if you need it at the Mapping Hour homepage. Last time, wow, that was a tour de force work by Kylie walking us through Survey123. What a powerful tool for constructing data. This is the one that is the most common we find among schools and doing any kind of field data collection. And it's great for thinking about design. That whole issue of designing your data collection experience is really important. That's one that you really have to work through. I got to think about what I need at the end and then work my way forward into it, working with the different types of questions in order to make sure that you get the data that you need. Good questions are what generate good data. And adding a location into the survey in order to tie all of that data to a point or actually now it can use a line or an area. But the point is the one that we find used most commonly. And then those neat projects that Tom was showing last episode. So what have we got today? More, because this is a really essential capacity that takes a little bit of getting used to. There's a, there's a process to learn in order to take Survey123 offline and have it still give you that base map. So the important part of walking through this flow, while you're doing this, you get to see a family of tools being integrated. And this is really a nice metaphor for all of ArcGIS Online, the ArcGIS family. There's a series of products that work beautifully with each other. And that whole capacity for integrating technologies, that's what education really needs to engage just because we got people on different operating systems, different devices, laptops, smartphones, tablets, all of these things can work together. So this is today is really a nice metaphor for the whole broad platform working together. And then you'll see this concept of a feature layer and a view on that, a customized display of some of the data. But you're going to get there. And to get us going, it's time for Kylie. You ready to take over, Kylie? Sure, Charlie. Thanks. So one thing I wanted to remind you guys about is with Survey123, right, the whole point is to collect good data. Now, if you remember in episode six, Joseph was talking about GPS and how you get a location, right? So when you're using Survey123, one of the cool things is if you're on a mobile device, you can take advantage of that GPS. Now, one of the downsides is gonna be we don't always have a good signal um, for our cell phone in terms of data. Now, our GPS isn't gonna be affected by that, but seeing the base map is. So you have some choices you can make. One choice you can make is to just trust your GPS. You can just push the I'm right here button and let Survey123 use that location. Now we haven't seen Survey123 on a mobile device yet. You may remember yesterday we were working all in the browser even for filling out the form. And that does work as well. But if you're really going around areas, it's nice to have something that you can just carry with you on your phone when you don't have that connection. Because obviously if you don't have a data connection, you can't work in a browser because that relies on that connection. Okay, so Joseph was talking about your GPS, right? And I can just hope that it's good enough and just push the put my point where I am button. But it's really nice to be able to see a base map or some kind of information behind that that helps us look at that geolocation and identify, okay, is this good? Did I have a good GPS signal? Were there, you know, trees, tall buildings? Those impact how good that position that your phone knows is. So you, you can't evaluate that if you don't have something to compare that point to when you're looking at your phone. So what I'm going to do today is take you through a process that lets you take that reference base map offline with you onto your mobile device. Now you can see on my screen here, I think of this as a four-step process. 
And part of why I think of it as a four-step process is, as Charlie mentioned earlier, we are going to use four different tools, okay? And I think of each tool as kind of fitting a part of this process or workflow. The other component here, and I've called it out kind of in that yellowy orange color off to the side, is I think of it as different people who are often going to do this part of the workflow. Now, the full workflow involves creating your survey, creating these base maps that are going to be used offline, getting it onto a mobile device, going into the field and using it. Now, in reality, that may not be all one person. I might be the teacher setting up a class project, and I'm going to create a survey that every student is going to use as they go around our school and, for example, collect the tree species. Well, our school, I know my daughter's is one of these, it's in a very populated area, but it just has bad cell signal. And their classroom doesn't have Wi-Fi, uh, cellular enabled devices. They have Wi-Fi on it, but their school Wi-Fi doesn't cover the whole playground. So even at that school, which I think of as very technically enabled, they even need to be able to work offline. So this is not a rare occurrence, and we really wanna make sure you can be successful taking your survey with you to the field and having that base map so again, you know if you got good data. Because our data isn't useful if we don't know how good it is. Right? If you're not sure where that tree really was, because you can't, it looks like someone placed it maybe in the swimming pool across the street from the school, you, all you know is it's wrong. You don't know what's right. All right, enough of that. We're gonna go ahead and jump in here. Now, the first part of this workflow is gonna be creating the survey. Now, if you're not sure how to do that, Go watch the last episode. Go look at episode 11. That's gonna talk you through that, okay? And for today, we're still gonna look at the survey, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and jump over, and this will be the same things you saw in the other episode. So here you can see I'm in the web browser, and I'm looking at the surveys available to me. Now, I have this offline one I've set up before. It has a couple records even. Okay, we've used that one. And today I'm gonna look at this trash cache offline. Now, we're going to go ahead, first we're going to open it and see this survey. And you can see right now we get some of this overview information. It's private. It reminds me of some of those things. That's great. To get to that view we were used to yesterday, I'm going to click here to the design tab. I'm going to just tell you a fun fact about this survey. You may remember when Tom did geo projects yesterday, he mentioned there was a trash cache one. Well, that's actually what I used to create this. So I went ahead and I used one of those cool projects so I could give you guys a nice realistic example of something you might want to do around your campus and take offline. So I didn't have to build this survey. Tom did that work for me. So thanks, Tom. While I'm in here, one of the things we looked at the other day was the map and how you can change it, right? You can pick a base map. You can set it all up. This is all for online use, okay? So this this is what I think of as the survey one, two, three designer or authoring part of the website. Okay, you saw two parts of the survey one, two, three application in a browser the other day. There was this authoring experience and there was also the filling out experience, right? When we'd go to preview and we'd look at what the person would see as they were filling out the survey. Okay, so in the browser, we can author and as we're working on right now, we can preview two different parts of the same application, but they're both in the browser, okay? So let's go ahead and close that on out. So right now what we've done is that first step. I'm gonna jump over to the slides and just, it's just what we were looking at yesterday. Use the web app because that's a great interface for designing and creating your survey. Start there, make the survey you need, just like we did before, okay? Now it's gonna start to get a little bit more tricky so hold on, we'll get there. All right, the next thing we wanna look at is this concept of offline map areas and creating map areas. Now, this is something that's part of ArcGIS Online. Survey uses it, other applications can use it as well. So the way we're gonna do this is we're going to go into ArcGIS Online and we're gonna do some work there for this step. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and switch tabs. Right now, what I'm jumping to is in my organization, and I've gone to my content. You may remember this from earlier episodes, right? Nothing I'm doing here at first is going to be new to you. I'm actually gonna start just with opening this web map I made the other day, so that you can get an idea of this map. So in this map, I can see some metadata. Okay, it's an imagery base map for Redland schools to use offline. Okay, 
not shared too interestingly right now. I'm gonna go ahead. So I'm opening this map I made the other day and let's look at the content tab. All right, all I have here is a base map. Now in this case, I have the imagery base map because that's the one I find really useful at a school when I'm working offline. I find especially with children that it resonates really well to have that imagery and be a real world picture. Like I personally, like I know Joseph kind of likes those USA Topo maps, right? They're fun for me, but for a child, they don't help associate where I am looking to a physical place on the earth in the same way imagery does. And so often when I do this workflow, it is the imagery base map that I'm gonna use. Now, you may have a different base map that you've been using with your class. Great, use that one. Today, we're going to stick to imagery. So when I'm in here, I can see that I have a base map. That's most of what I have here. The only other thing I've set up is some bookmarks. So I made some bookmarks for different schools. Okay, and in fact, I'm going to go ahead and add one right now. So I'm going to find there's one school I've left out of that list. And here we go, McKinley Elementary School in Redlands. So what I've done now is I've just zoomed to that area. You can see the school right here. There's another one of our local schools. I'm gonna go ahead and add a bookmark. And to do that's pretty easy. I just click add bookmark. And I give it a name and hit enter. Go ahead and save those changes so that I have that available. And there's a reason I'm doing these bookmarks and it'll become clear in just a moment. So now I have a map. And I have some schools. I can go look at Mariposa Elementary. Joseph's going to love this one because we're right where two tiles intersect. Now, it's actually a great time for me to tell you about something. This base map is made up of tiles. Okay, so there's these pictures. And you can see right here, you can picture that I have taken two pictures from the air of this school. And I went and I printed them at my local print shop. And I got back my two, say, three by five pictures, right? and I've set them next to each other. Now, the store happened to print them on different printers. They look a little bit different, but they are still showing the same places. And so that's this line you see in the middle. It's because it happens to be where two of these pictures, often called tiles, meet. So just think of them as little chunks of pictures, right? And we've taped them all together on the back to make one bigger image. Now, the reason that's interesting is if you think about the size of a picture, if I was to put all of Redlands onto one three by five, that's a pretty big city. If we zoom out, we can start to see the city and the area it's in. It's pretty much this whole area. That on that little postcard, I don't see much detail. But if I now take this and instead of printing all of Redlands on, in one three by five image, I go back to Mariposa, and I've printed this part of Redlands onto two pictures. I can get more detail in because each of those pictures goes outside the bounds here. I'm not seeing the whole thing. If I move the map, you can actually see another edge, right? So picture these tiles that way. It's a picture of Redlands and the amount that fits on each of my three by five pictures is gonna be different based on how zoomed in I am or how much detail there is. So tiles are done that way when you're looking at imagery online. When I'm zoomed really far out, I'm seeing that one three by five that has the whole city on it. And as I zoom in, I'm not looking in closer at the same picture. I didn't pick up a magnifying glass. I've moved that three by five off my pile of three by fives. And now I'm looking at two that are next to each other that have more information. Okay, now hold on to that because that does play into how we're able to go offline. So just remember, we have this stack of pictures, and in each picture, as we move one off the top, there's more detail below. And think of that as how we're zooming in here, okay? All right, so we've made some bookmarks, we've made a map. The next thing we need to do is create areas that people can take offline. Now, the way I'm gonna do that is actually back in the My Content view. When I go in here, I'm going to take that same map and go to its item page. We showed this in earlier episodes. That, that process is kind of familiar, right? This is where you came to see metadata. Now, in the settings over here, this is where I can do some of this powerful stuff with making areas. So I'm going to go ahead and go into the settings. And you can see here there's an offline section, so I could click that or I could just scroll down because I see it right here as well. I'm a scroller, so I'm going to go ahead and scroll down. All right, 
maps can be taken offline if they meet certain qualifications. So you may not see this section at all. You may see it disabled. When you've just put a base map, and especially the Esri base maps into your map, we've set those up to work offline. So you'll be safe here. If you're making your own base maps, if you have other data in your map, that might get a little bit tricky. And you're gonna have to pay a lot more attention to what can and can't go offline. But for this workflow, all I want is that base map. So I'm pretty safe. The important part here is this section, map areas. Okay, I don't have to do this, but I can create map areas ahead of time to package data. All right, let's go ahead and check that out. I'm gonna jump into the manage areas experience. Now, this isn't the map viewer, but it looks a little bit similar, right? What this is, is just a special little app that helps us create these areas to go offline. Now, if you remember, I was talking about that imagery as being like a bunch of three by five pictures, right? And what I'm actually doing with this tool is I'm picking a stack of those pictures that I care about and I'm wrapping them all up together to make it easy to put them on my mobile device. And that's how I'm going to take it offline is I'm going to create this special bundle of those pictures and put it right on my device so that I'm not going over the internet to get that picture that picture will be on the device. All right, so if you remember when we looked at my map, I had four bookmarks and these were the four. So you can see these four schools and what I've done in this example is I, I'm pretending that this trash cash project I'm doing, I want all of the second graders in Redlands to get to participate at their own school. So I don't know exactly which school the person filling out the survey will be at. So I'm setting it up so that people at any of these schools can be successful with my survey. If you remember back to my slides, and we'll go back to them, right now I have my survey author hat on. I'm still setting this up and authoring it. I'm the teacher or the person, maybe I'm a student creating this for different schools to do, right? But right now I'm, I'm the person in charge of how it's defined, defining the project area, the scope, all of those things. All right, but I did make a new bookmark. So we need to add a an area for that. And this is the process you would do if this is one of your own maps and you don't have any of these map areas. Whether you're creating your first map area for this map or your 50th, it's the same process. So I wanted to have some in here so you could see it. Let's go ahead and add that new one. Now there's a reason I used bookmarks, which is that while you're in this interface, you do still have access to those bookmarks. So in particular, I can click right here and see my bookmarks. So I know which one I want, and I'm gonna go ahead and pick McKinley Elementary, because that was my new one. And I'm taken to right where I wanna go. At this point, I need to go ahead and create a new area. So I'm gonna click that option for create new area, and I'm gonna give it a name. This name is important because this is what my user is gonna see when they're in the mobile app. So I wanna make sure that I name it so that it's distinct. For example, I could be using imagery and streets offline. So if I just called this McKinley, they may not know which base map they were gonna get, they'd just know the area. And if I just called it imagery, well, you already saw I have five of these, right? So then they wouldn't know which area it would be. So I tend to do a combo of the names. Where is it and what's the base map I'm getting? All right. While I'm in here, I also change level of detail. Think about this as how many of those three by five pictures you're gonna have, right? So the level of detail is going to show how far I can zoom in and get clear imagery, okay? And it actually has a pretty good helper here. I can grab this and slide it. And I can see that little preview. It's showing about how far I'd be able to zoom in. Well, I'm looking at the school, so let's go on down to room value. I'd like them to be able to zoom in pretty far. Now, you can move this upper one as well, but if you think back to our three by five cards, I put the whole city of Redlands onto one photo. One photo doesn't make my stack a lot thicker, and by the same kind of token, it's not gonna make this bundle of pictures that I make a lot bigger. Since these are pretty small areas, I just leave it world. And one reason is it sometimes helps when you're zoomed out really far to find even where to start. All right, so we're gonna leave that world and we're gonna leave it rooms and update. Now, 
This is really cool if I was putting a lot of data in here that was changing, because what it does is it says, I can update this bundle you made so that everyone can always get the latest and greatest. That's not helpful to me when I'm looking at base maps. These base maps are fairly static. They do change occasionally. We are regularly updating them, getting new imagery into them, but not often enough that I'm worried about my students having the base map as it was last week. So I'm gonna go ahead and say never. I don't need you to update this for me. Just make it once and we'll be good. So that's all ready to go. And I'm gonna go ahead and hit save. Oh, good, it caught me. I forgot to actually provide the extent. So while I've zoomed in, that's not enough. So let's close that reminder. And remember, we, got, we need to come over here and we need to actually draw on the map the area it is. It doesn't use the extent here. It uses what I tell it to use. So I need to make sure I've drawn that box. There we go. That captures the area of the school. A little bit around it, but that's okay. All right, let's try that saving again. All right, so you can see now it says packaging. And what that means is it's essentially taking all of our three by five photos that you had in a pile, and it's making sure they all get placed together and bundled up so they can be handed to your mobile device. It's called a tile package, because if you remember, we said each of those three by fives, it's like a tile of an image, right? So that's where that terminology kind of comes from. So what this tool does is it creates that tile package for you. Now, this isn't the only way to accomplish an offline workflow with Survey123. What I really like about this workflow is it keeps me in tools that are a little bit more familiar. It, um, and it has this nice interface for defining the package. Now, I could make this tile package any supported way I want, and there are a number, and then share it with my survey in a very variety of ways. So if this doesn't work for you, or if you don't like this tool, let us know, we can point you to some resources on the other ways. But this is, I think, one of the most simple workflows, which is why I really focus on it. The other thing I like about this workflow is it does keep that separation of author and user, where I, as the author of the survey, do a little bit more work, but my end user or my student who's gonna go in the field or the people filling out my student surveys, they don't need to understand all of this. So one person needs to get a little bit technical here and learn this for the benefit of all the people filling it out. All right, so my area has generated. You can see it's done over here. I'm gonna go ahead and close this Manage Areas dialog, and you see I do have five available now. All right, so we created our survey, same as the other day. Just now, we created an offline map area or created a map area. You'll hear it kind of used interchangeably as offline map area or just map area. And that, just as a reminder, was in the ArcGIS Online Map Viewer and the Item Page, so those tools that we've used throughout these episodes. All right, I'm gonna pause for a moment because that's a lot to take in. Hey, Joseph, what do you wanna fill in here? Hey, Kylie, I'm, I'm really intrigued by that very first thing that you talked about where you took the, the resources that Tom had created and you made a survey from that, uh, the projects you referred to. Could you... Could you expand that a little bit? That's great because that means I don't have to create my own tree survey or my own trash survey. I'm really interested in how you did that. Okay, cool, yeah. So there is still a bit manual to it. What I did to do it is I went to the Geo Projects website and I found the trash cache project because that was what I wanted to do. And by opening it, there was a demo survey in it. And so I opened that demo survey and then I just opened my own browser next to it and I recreated that so that I had a copy. But all of the work of choosing what types things needed to be, remember we talked yesterday a lot, or last episode, a lot about how what's really important to get good data is to not only ask a good question, but also give them a good way to provide their answer or type. So I was able to benefit from all the work, thought that Tom had put in in designing that survey. So you put Tom's trash cash survey and then you created survey one, two, three side by side and you looked at his template and you modified it perhaps, but you basically used what he had. That's yeah. awesome, thanks. Yeah, it was a great jump start. I didn't, I didn't wanna come up with another survey, but I really wanted to show something interesting and realistic here. All right, so Charlie, what do you got? My question is about when you said, hey, I like to use the name of the place and then the base map, and that made me think, boy, I would like to have a second base map in there. 
is there a way as you're creating that tile package to swap the base map? Sure. And I'll actually show you my favorite tip on how to do that. You notice I used bookmarks, right? And part of why I did that, I'm going to jump back over to this other tab and I'm going to go back to the overview. Of the, we're still looking at my map, right? So what I've done in the past is I've gone ahead and opened this map in the map viewer. I have my bookmarks set up. I know the areas I'm interested in. And what I'll do is I'll change the base map for it. And say I want to also make tile packages for the street space map. So now I've got my street space map. And what I do here is I do a save as. Okay, and when I do that save as, I can take this name and instead of having to be the imagery base map, we can do the street space map. And I need to make sure I update my metadata as well. And I can save this map. So what I've made now is a new map. But the work I did on setting up those bookmarks, I know I'll be able to create areas for the same way. So that's kind of the way I do it. You could take the same map and change the base map, but then if you ever do need to go update those packages, you have to remember which base map to have as you update each one. And I found that became a little bit too taxing on my memory. I would rather have two maps set up and ready to go. So now if we go ahead and we wanted to, we could go into the item page for this new map and you'll see we have very similar tools to what we just did. We can go into the settings, we can go to the offline area, and you can see we don't have map areas. So those map areas are not part of what is saved over because there's a reason I've created a new map. There's something different. And so we don't want to assume that you want those same tile packages and we've left it up to you. But I can come in here and I'll do this really quick just so we can see another one and we can create an area. And I'll use McKinley since we're already right here. I can drag my box, I can give it a name, and like I did before, I'll use that McKinley Streets, that trick I was talking about. We'll set that same extent. We'll remember we don't need it to always update. We'll go ahead and create it. Now, I don't need to wait while it's packaging. I can actually leave, and that'll complete while I'm doing other things. You'll see, though, it's pretty cool how you can get multiple ones. All right, so I think that's good. We've created some great map areas. I've thought about who might be filling out my survey and where they might need to go offline. So that's really important there. I, as our survey author, need to be thinking about who's gonna be filling out the survey and where they need to work. That is one of the tough ones. I can't just say, hey, everyone, go use this wherever you want offline because I need to have set this up, okay? So right now I've made this survey. It's over here in Survey123 web app, right? And that lives in ArcGIS Online, but it's kind of accessed this other way, and we'll look, at, we'll look at where it really is in a minute. But it's kind of separate, right? And then we have this map with map areas. But they don't know about each other right now. So that's what I need to fix next, okay? So the next thing we're gonna do is we're going to tell the survey about those map areas. And we're gonna use a new tool to do that, and that's called Survey123 Connect. Now, this is a desktop app, that's a freely available download that you can get through the Survey123 websites, but it is only supported on Windows, Mac, and Linux. So, not on your Chromebook. So if you have students doing this process, they may need to work with you on a laptop. Often the teacher might have a full laptop, even if the students don't. If you're only on Chromebooks, talk to us and there are some other workarounds, but the majority of times we find that someone has access to either a Mac, a Linux, or a Windows machine, okay? So that is required here. And I'm gonna go ahead and bring that up, app up now. It's a little bit different interface, but there's similarities, right? Okay, we recognize these things. I'm gonna go ahead for a minute and jump back in the browser to the list of my surveys. Okay, treasure hunt, we can look at the pictures, right? There's four that are all by me. And down here, there's another one, but Tom made that one. So it kind of makes sense. I don't, I don't have authoring. I can't edit that one. There's no little pencil. So what I see in Connect is the things that I can work with and edit. Now, this one shows dots. These ones show download. That's because although I've made these surveys, I haven't worked with them in Survey123 Connect. So in order to work with them in Connect, the first thing I need to do is download that survey to the computer where I'm using Connect. 
I did this with Treasure Hunt offline because again, offline, using this app as a key component of setting it up. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and click that download button. And it says I don't have it on my computer yet. And that's really key here. I'm getting a local copy of this. I'm pulling down information about the survey. Yeah, great, I know I need to use it here. So let's grab it. Okay, now I've got it on my computer. We can see it's got the dots as well. And I'm gonna go ahead and open it. Survey123 Connect is actually a full design experience like the browser was. And in fact, there are some advanced things you can do with your surveys in Connect that you can't do in the browser. But it's a little bit more complicated to author for. You can notice here, there isn't that same nice drag and drop interface. And in fact, we're not gonna get into this a lot right now. There are other resources that can help you with it, but you author through using an Excel spreadsheet. And the way you set up your spreadsheet and your tables actually creates the survey. Well, that could be a really powerful, powerful lesson on its own, looking at how a spreadsheet can turn into a survey, right? But not right now. Right now, I just wanna get my job done. So in this case, all my authoring was done in the web app. What I'm gonna do here is go into the settings for this survey. Because right now, what I wanna work on is the offline setup of this map. And one of the things I can do in the settings so I can look at all this information. You can see here's the geo, the geo project that I used in my metadata. I put a link to it in case someone else would like to do the same. And there's linked content. Now what linked content is, is it says, hey, there's other stuff I might wanna use with this survey. And there is, I wanna use that base map I just set up. So I need to tell this survey about that base map. So I'm going to add a map link. And you can see in here, I'm getting quite a list. Here's um, one of the maps that Joseph made in an earlier session. Here's Charlie's three places map from ep a few episodes ago. Oh, look, there's the map that Tom and Charlie made together. So you're gonna have access to all of these web maps that you have in your org, right? These are all things that are shared with me through various groups I'm a part of or with the organization as a whole. In this case, I want that street space map and I want this imagery one. So I'm gonna start with the imagery one and I'll say okay to add it. You can see it's been added in here. I'm gonna add another map link and I'm gonna pick the streets one because as Charlie mentioned, sometimes we do want to. So those are both added in here. All right, now I've noticed that this is pretty much all I need to do to set up. So I'm gonna go ahead and I do like to publish my survey just because I feel better, like I've committed these changes. I don't believe you always have to, but when I make changes, I just like to make sure I have the latest and greatest updated. And also this way you can see similar things as when you publish from the browser, right? It updated different things, it completed. You're seeing some of that same information. The same pieces are worked with. And in fact, if you notice, let me jump back here, my picture right here, my picture right here are the same. So right now I'm signed in in the web browser and in the app as the same person, okay? So that's why I could see this content. That's how I can work with it. That's how I saw those maps. This is a signed in experience and I'm working with that signed in. All right, so what I needed to do here, I needed to download my survey and I needed to link it to some content, okay? We came in. We went to the settings, just because this app is a little bit new and complex, just a really quick refresher of those key buttons. I do find settings sometimes takes a minute to open because there's so much information with this map, so just be patient and then jump on into the link content. Whoa, what's happened here? All right, so you can notice it was able to tell that this web map of imagery had a Mariposa imagery tile package. And look, here's the McKinley one we created together. So even though, those, even though those didn't show up at first, because of how they were built as part of that web map, by linking my web map, I've linked my tile packages. And if you remember, that was the key, right? I needed that tile package, that bundle of those three by five photos that I could put onto my device. So my survey now knows about them. And let's scroll, okay? We've got the Mariposa, McKin all these schools and all their packages, okay? Now I'm not seeing the streets one right now. There are two reasons that could happen. One is I missed a step because we threw that in. And the other is that, like you saw these appeared after time, it just hasn't finished refreshing. Maybe it hasn't even finished packaging, right? If you remember, we didn't wait for that to all complete. So there could be a couple reasons. At this point, I wouldn't worry about it. 
I'm just going to keep going. We may see it later. It may be something we have to come check out later. All right, but let's keep going. So I'm going to jump back to my slide. We created our survey. We were in the web browser. We then moved to the ArcGIS Online Map Viewer and Item page where we made our map areas, right? So now we have our survey, we have our map areas. And what I just did with Survey123 Connect is I put those together. I didn't copy either, but now they're tied together. They know about each other. And because they're all in ArcGIS Online, they can communicate, they can talk to each other. They have that common language that lets them do that. All right, I'm gonna pause for a second again. Give it a second to sink in. Okay, we're in the browser app, online, connect. All right, Joseph, what do you got for me? Any, anything in your head right now? Yeah, that last part where you're inside the connect tool in survey one, two, three, you only have to say, I'm gonna link to the map. It's, it's nice to know that you've got those, those tile packages, but you don't have to connect to that. It knows that, that the tile packages are, are, are linking to the map. So all you have to do is link to the map, correct? Right, and that's a really good point to make because you may have noticed in that dialogue when I was browsing, the tile packages weren't a choice. I had made them, they existed, but ArcGIS Online only knows them as a part of that map. So I do need to link to the map and I'll automatically get all of the tile packages that were made with it. It has limitations too, right? I can't exclude some of the tile packages. I need, maybe if I need different sets of tile packages, I might have to create different maps just to house the different collections. But that's where that's coming from, is that association. Thanks for confirming. All right. Yeah, Tom? So before we talked about, with ArcGIS Online needing to have publisher permission to do a bunch of work, it, do we only need publisher permission still, or are we moving into more advanced things? This is still just publishing. You're creating these tile packages, and you're setting them up just as you would other content. Right. One thing I didn't show here, you will, of course, need permission to share if you do want other people to be able to access these map areas. So I didn't show that because, as you noticed, I'm just logged in as me the whole time. Mm -hmm. But as a publisher, I can come in, I can create them and I can share them and then others can consume them. They do need to be logged in, though, to use these. Gotcha. Thanks. Yep. All right. We've covered three tools. Might as well go to another one. So what I'm going to do now is we're transitioning a bit, right? This whole chunk here, who's doing the work? Survey author, right? Now I'm going into a mobile app. Okay, let's check it out. Now, I'm gonna bring that up. I'm gonna minimize the slide just so it's not distracting you right behind there, and I'll minimize connect, just clean this up a little. What you're seeing here is my Android phone. Now, I have it connected to my computer through a cable right now, and I'm using a program called a power mirror, as you can see that watermark on the screen. What that program does is it's just taking the exact screen I see on my mobile device and putting it on my PC screen so that I can share it with you guys as part of this call. You can do it in other ways to bring it in. I could have joined the Zoom call from the device and shared the device's screen. This was just simpler. It's also a great tool if I wanted to be able to show my classroom, for example, how to work with this mobile app. There are ways, it's a free app, that you can download and share your screen. So maybe I'm standing in front of the class now and I don't want them all having to see my phone screen because it's pretty small. That, this is a tool to use. One thing you'll notice, it does have this watermark, which you can join a program and remove those watermarks. I've chosen not to do that at this point because this works for my purposes, but you will see that watermark in some of our screens. So here's the Survey123 app and I'm gonna go ahead and open it. Well, where's my survey? So we haven't used the mobile app a lot, but the way the mobile app works is it doesn't show any surveys the first time you open it. I have the treasure hunt offline because I've used that one before. As you saw, I've done the same workflow before. So in Survey123's mobile app, you click on your, your little icon. This is me logged in again as that same person, my K-12 org account, and you need to download the survey you wanna work with. So by default, You'll see nothing in this view. You'll click over here and you'll be able to download that survey. All right, now I'm seeing tons of things. Wow, I'm seeing all these surveys here. I see the walkability one I know Joseph did some work on. I see the ones I did. I see, okay, cool. Well, here's my trash cash offline one. I know that's the one I want today. So I'm gonna go ahead and click the download button here. 
that's downloaded my survey. Okay, if I go out of this experience by clicking this back arrow up in the corner, I'm going to leave downloading surveys and go back to using them. I've got two choices now. Okay, great. My survey is now on my device. So I can come in here and I can open the one that I want to do. All right, I can see my information. I can see when it was last created, modified. I could go jump right in and collect. And that's great. Here's my survey. On a phone, I can see a map, but you may notice I also have reception right now. I'm connected. So let's go ahead and close out of this, and I don't need my changes that I've made. What I wanna show you guys is also how to work with this offline. So if I'm connected, you just got a little sneak peek. The mobile app works connected, it has a map, right? I'm sure you could kind of assume that in a connected world, this is all just fine and happy. Okay, the offline world, what we need to do is after we've downloaded our survey, we open it, so we're looking at kind of the details page about the survey and where we can jump into collection. Up in this little three line menu, there's a great name for it. I often hear it called a burger menu because it looks like the two buns with the meat. I just think that's a great name. So I'm gonna go ahead and click the burger menu and offline maps. That's what I need. If I want to work offline, I need to take those map areas I made and put them on my device. Right now I've created them. I've said, hey, survey, here's map areas. You guys know about each other, but they're still not on this phone. So I need to go on into those offline maps and it takes a minute to find them, but look, here we go. All right, and I can think sometimes the way this screen mirroring software works, it doesn't quite load all the icons. So you'll see some of those download icons are missing. Just picture them along with me. They're download icons. Sometimes I can go out and come back in and that'll fix it, but sometimes it doesn't. Yep, this time it did. All right, great. So we've got our download icons. We can see the different areas. And for example, if I knew what schools I was gonna work at, I could download the one for that area. I could download the one for another area. Now you'll notice the streets one that we had talked about, it isn't here right now. So I would have to go back and figure out, I'm sure it was just a demo error. There's something going on there, but it's not any different than these others. So for now, I'll just focus on the imagery. And I'm gonna download two different ones so that we have those available. All right, so I picked the ones for the area I'm going to work at. Maybe I'm someone who goes to both Smiley and McKinley. Maybe I'm a parent with a kid at each one. Okay, so I've got my areas that we need to use offline. I can jump back out of here. Now, here's a trick. Right now, you guys don't know if I'm offline or not, right? And since I decided to project my screen onto my computer and I'm not relying on my phone to be the, on the Zoom call, I'm actually going to take my phone right now and pull down some settings, and I'm gonna go into airplane mode. I'm sure you've all used airplane mode, but just in case someone isn't sure, what that does is it says, I don't want cellular connections, I don't want Wi-Fi connections. My data connection is turned off. Now, as I mentioned earlier, this doesn't affect your GPS, but it does affect those other parts of data, like your base map, okay? So now my phone is offline. What I can do now is go on in and collect. And we can scroll down and we can find our map and look. Did you notice last time it looked kind of like that streets map? And now we've got some imagery going on here. If I click on that map, it actually zooms in to that imagery. Now I can go in here and place my point by clicking on the map. I'm not sure where I clicked there, sorry. Sometimes my finger is a little bit jumpy. So I can always hit the home button, get back to what I need to see. I can go in and I can change base. But remember, we talked about sometimes the tools look different. And I, remember, I think it was Joseph even said, this weird little four panel thing that looks like four little maps side by side, that's your base map switcher. Well, so guess what it's gonna do here? Look, I can pick Smiley. I can pick McKinley. So those things I downloaded, I have available and I can switch between them. So imagine I had Charlie's McKinley Streets downloaded as well. I could choose the McKinley imagery. I could go to that location. My finger is being a bit jumpy today on trying to zoom this on a phone. So I'm actually gonna pick up my mobile device. So you're not gonna see the little hand moving correctly. I'll get it out of the way. And I'm just going to zoom in working with my phone. The cool thing with this app is it doesn't matter whether I use 
the computer to interact with the mobile device or the mobile device itself. So I'm just zooming in, using a little pinch and stretch with my fingers on my mobile phone now. And here's McKinley School. And you'll notice, as I zoom in, it's getting really clear. That's because of that size I said. I wanted to be able to get down to the room level. I want to be able to collect those trees. Now, interestingly, if you remember, my area that I said I wanted to take offline was about that big. But what's all this other stuff around it? I got a lot more than that. Well, that's because it's tiles. I didn't take half of one of my three by five photos with me, even though at some level, the ones the, at the, the more zoomed out extent, that more information I can see all fits onto one three by five. I didn't cut the three by five and only keep the one part of it I cared about for one reason. Imagine trying to do that, right? Like knowing exactly where it was when you can barely see it. No, that would take way more effort. It just says, you know what, it's one three by five. I'm just going to put it in the pile that I wrap up for you. So you'll find that if I zoom into a different area, it does start to get a little bit fuzzy, right? That's because that is only on certain cards. And you can even see a line there if you look really carefully. Right about here, we can see where two, two of those tiles are meeting up. All right, so you will get a little bit of additional area. And look, it's a lot clearer here because that happens to be also on other of our little photo three by five cards that I package. And again, when I get to the school itself, which is the area I really cared about, wow, I can even see the cracks in the pavement on that school. Okay, so I have this great imagery. You can remember I am offline. You can see the little airplane up there. My phone doesn't have a connection right now, a data connection. It's plugged into my computer, but only for display. It's not actually reading that. And that's why as we zoom, we saw it got fuzzy. And if we zoom out, look, there's the edge. There's the edge of the tile that I took. So this is the region I got, right? Even though I said McKinley. All right. So things that we saw in here. Let's go ahead and go back. And I'm going to go, that was leaving the map. And now I'm actually going to leave collecting that point. And in this case, I don't need to save the work I was doing. I could if I wanted to. And in survey one, two, three, I could collect 20 different points right now, all while offline. And then after I'm back in the classroom and have a better connection, then I could submit them all. So I don't have to just do one point. I can do all the work I need to do while offline. And that was because we, the reason we could see the base map while doing that was because I came in here and look, I can't get more offline maps. Anyone know why? All right. The trick is that little airplane, right? Like how could I, yeah. How could I download a new map? when I have no data connection. So on my mobile device, I'm gonna go ahead and open it up, turn off airplane mode so I have a connection again. Now when I click, okay, I can get more of those offline maps. Say I needed to add another school. Say I was done at one of the schools I already had. It does take up space. You can see it's about two megabytes of data. I go ahead and delete it. Now, when I do that, it's a little hard to read this message with the watermark and the overlay, but that is saying I'm deleting the map package or the tile package from this device. I'm not deleting it from the map. I'm not deleting it from ArcGIS Online. I'm not deleting it from the student at the next desk who's also using it. I'm just taking it off of my phone because I don't need it anymore. Okay, so let's go jump back up to our slide. All right, so we made it, we made map areas, we linked them together, we said you know about each other, and then we picked up our mobile device, here's mine, I can't lift it too high because it's still plugged in in case we need it, and we took that map pack and we said go in here, go live here, so I can take this unplugged, I can take it outside, I can take it in airplane mode and do any data collection I need, and have a base map so I know where I'm putting that tree that I'm finding. So. With Survey123, you can take it offline, you can do all this work, you made all these things in the browser, and I mentioned at one point in there that these were in ArcGIS Online, right? They have a house. Let me jump back into here, and let me just go back to my content. So what I'm doing now is you can see all the folders of content that I have. Now, I organize my base maps that I use for offline work into some folders just so I know, don't mess with those, we need that and what it's for. And you can see these other folders. Well, I didn't create these. And you'll notice there's four. 
Well, let's look at Survey123 Connect again for a minute. And here's the things I can edit. All right. So how Survey123 works is it creates a folder in your My Content that holds all of the resources. So in the case of this trash cache one, we can go ahead and look in the folder. Here's our form. That's our survey. And then there are these two feature layers that were created. Now, one thing that's important to understand when doing data collection is that you have this layer. We talked a little bit about that, right? That's what's holding all your points. That is right here. Here's the thing you're working in. That's editable. So say I've watched the rest of the mapping hour and I know there are all these apps like story maps and dashboards and places I can use this data I've collected. And I was to take that layer and share it with the world. Well, it's editable. And what that's going to mean is that anyone who puts that layer into a map can work with that data and edit it. So one thing is understanding where survey has put your information. And the other is understanding that if you share it, it's editable because it needed to be so that you could add data to it. But that means people can change it. So in fact, let me go ahead and open it and stick it in the map viewer just to really show how that looks. So in this one, we didn't have any data in it, right? And I'm not worried about style. So I'm going to go ahead and hit cancel. And I can see my layer has come in. But I can hit edit. And I could right now add a trash cache offline feature. And I could put it right here while I'm here. I can change these fields. These are the same things that were in my form. OK, I don't want just anyone to be able to do that. I made this layer so that people would use it through survey one, two, three. I don't want it used here in a map. So if I was to take that layer and share it publicly so that I could put it in a story map, someone else could take that layer, put it in a map, and edit it, right? So there's a really cool concept in ArcGIS Online called a hosted feature layer view. And the keyword there is view. So if we jump back to our My Content, You'll see one of these. Here's that layer I just added, my trash cache offline, right? And that's the thing I said, you can do pretty much anything. Be careful, it's editable. Well, here's a view. So it looks pretty much the same. I only know it's a view because it has that word view on it. And this one's set up for the field worker. So Survey123 made this one, and it has a special use for it. But if I wanted to make one, I could create my own. Now, the value of doing that is that with a view, I can choose how much data to put in. I can choose what fields are included. I can choose if you can edit it or not. And it's, you have your hosted feature layer, right? This trash cache offline. And then you'd have your view. And I think of them as kind of sitting next to each other because the view doesn't have any data in it really. It references the data up in its parent. So if someone adds things, the view knows about it. But the view, won't show all of the information. Maybe it won't be editable. I can use that safely as a full feature layer and have all those capabilities, right? We looked before at the differences and how layers are added to the map and what you can and can't do. This view is a full hosted feature layer. I can do anything I need to do with it, but it has fully restricted access to the full raw data. Let me give you an example of when this could be important. Tom showed the mapping hour survey the other day. And one thing that people are putting in, if they're enjoying this series, they're adding email addresses. They need to if they want an account. If Tom was going to make a story map showing where people are watching mapping hour, we don't want to show everyone all those email addresses. That's, a, that's personal information that I'm not going to share out with other people. So if he wanted to, he could create a view off of that service. So really, the key here is that be aware your data is editable. People can change it, can edit it, can use it in different ways. It's part of this ArcGIS system. And even though I made it for Survey123, it can be accessed in other places. And it could be used maybe in ways I don't want. So be careful when you're sharing these things that you think about that. And if you do need a way to expose it, check out Feature Layer Views. And we're going to share some resources on that. All right. I have talked for a really long time this episode, and I had fun doing it because I love our field apps. I'm really passionate about it. I have fun working with it. Um, I hope some of that came through to you guys and you're excited to go try these tools, but I need to stop now. 
So I'm going to hand it over to Charlie and let him take us from here. Thanks, Kylie. That was awesome. That's just really exciting. The key piece is people need to be thinking about this. They need to be thinking about that end situation and, okay, how do I step back one notch from that and back and back so that they can do the setup in front to make all of those things move forward? It's like dominoes. What do I need to set up in order to make this last domino fall the way, it, just exactly the way I want? I got to set up all the preliminary dominoes, that capacity for working with different tools to accomplish a task is really significant. Perfect. Excellent demo. Thanks. All right. Let's see what we were anticipating looking at was going offline with a base map and we got that beautifully. That was a very nice integration of those four different components being able to come together to accomplish this. And that was the first show that we've had of your mobile app being able to do the data collection process. And then you got to see that whole really important vision of the feature layer that has the data and the, the feature layer view that allows you to customize that display. Well, so I wanna make sure that everybody is seeing this, this whole backwards design approach here, clarifying what's the end product and what are the steps that we need to put in place to get us there. In GIS, that's really the big issue is, can you conceive of what you want to have happen? Whether it's a map that you're making or the data that you're going to be collecting or the experience that somebody's gonna have in it. There is, for many of these things, a workflow, a sequence of steps that you follow. And it takes a little bit to get accustomed to each workflow as you're going through a process but once you get the concept that, are, that you need to have in a workflow for something of this type, then you can do all kinds of projects of that type following that same, it's sort of a template of actions. And this nice integration across the platform, the tools work together both across operating systems, across devices, it's ArcGIS Online is the central coordinator for all of these pieces. The Survey123 family, these tools work together and people who know how to do this, they can have more power just by being able to take advantage of this ability to work across these tools. Those tile packages are really neat. And the feature layer view, that custom exposure, it, it allows you to be safe. It allows you to have the right kinds of permissions going to the right people. And so there are some resources. Much of this is what we had in episode 11, but we've added in here the help file to look at hosted views. And then we've added in a playlist that is the Survey123 playlist for videos. There are a number of videos that are up on uh, YouTube focused just on Survey123, put together by the Survey123 team. So all the rest of these are just like you see in episode 11, but it's really useful. And if if you jumped into episode 12 and don't really have Survey123 in your mind, just go back to episode 11, which you'll find here at the Mapping Hour. And that's it for this episode. Wow, the power everybody's going to have access to. Thanks for being here. Bye-bye.